Hello and welcome to this mini gem, warming up to hypothermia. My name is Nicola Pew and I'm a CT2 core medical trainee in the East Midlands Deanery. This mini gem aims to cover the why, what, who and how of hypothermia, as well as looking at strategies for prevention and treatment. We will also explore the additional considerations needed when dealing with hypothermia in cardiac arrest. Why is hypothermia important? While the winter period of 2017 to 18 saw over 50,000 excess winter deaths, few were attributed to hypothermia directly. The majority of additional winter deaths were caused by cerebrovascular diseases, ischemic heart disease, respiratory diseases and dementia. However, the cold can have physiological effects such as increasing blood pressure, increasing hemoconcentration and lowering the immune resistance to respiratory illness. Hypothermia may be due to an underlying social issue, such as poor accommodation, living in poverty, or an undiagnosed medical condition, making a person more susceptible. And most importantly, it's preventable. Hypothermia is defined as a clinical condition characterised by the unintentional lowering of core body temperature below physiological normal limits, typically below 35 degrees centigrade or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and is classified using the Swiss staging system. The staging system separates hypothermia into four stages. Hypothermia, abbreviated here to HT, 1, 2, 3 and 4. And these correspond with mild, moderate, severe and a low flow state. The important thing to remember is that patients with mild hypothermia can be treated with passive rewarming strategies. All other stages should be treated with active rewarming strategies. A patient in a low flow state may have minimal vital signs or even no vital signs but be very cautious diagnosing death in this group of patients. The cold state is neuroprotective and to some degree cardioprotective and full recovery can still be achieved after prolonged resuscitation. There are many different groups of people susceptible to hypothermia. Here are a few. The elderly are particularly susceptible because of their normal physiology, as well as any comorbidities they might have, which can impair their detection of a cold environment or their response to it. As a person ages, their blood vessels become less elastic and there is a thinning of the fat layer under the skin, which can usually help conserve heat. There are also a group in which falls and polypharmacy are more likely. Also, don't forget that with the exception of the very young, the very old can also fall into any one of the categories on the left. The chronically ill, the malnourished, the exhausted, the intoxicated and the trauma victim. How is hypothermia measured? Tympanic membrane measurements can be unreliable at colder temperatures, particularly under 27.5 degrees. Esophageal or rectal monitoring reflect more accurately the core temperature. However, in the initial emergency management, infrared tympanic monitoring will suffice. And how does hypothermia occur? It occurs when the body dissipates more heat than it absorbs. The main ways in which the heat is lost is via infrared radiation, conduction to colder objects that are close to the skin, Convection, whereby cold air or water currents remove any warm air or water from around the person, or evaporation. If you imagine an elderly person slipping when coming out of the bath in their drafty bathroom and unable to get up from the cold floor, they will be experiencing all four of these heat losses. It would not take a great deal of time for them to become dangerously cold. Prevention is better than cure. And I would urge all of you seeing elderly patients on a regular basis to familiarise yourselves with how to advise and signpost someone to keep warm during the winter months, if you're not already. Practical steps such as eating well, keeping mobile and dressing in layers rather than in one or two big items of clothing are useful initial steps. A review of falls risk factors and optimisation of comorbidities will help address some of the underlying risk factors for hypothermia. Importantly, there are grants available for those meeting eligibility criteria including the winter fuel allowance, the cold weather payment, and the warm home discount scheme. Age UK can also offer some assistance. Treat the patient with hypothermia as any other patient in terms of initial ABC assessment, not forgetting to inspect for cold injuries such as frostbite. If there is mild hypothermia present, then the use of passive rewarming with warmed blankets should suffice, remembering to remove any wet clothing first. If moderate or severe hypothermia is present, then active rewarming should be considered. A bear hugger blanket is a single-use blanket which has a forced warm air current. 
One disadvantage is an after drop, which is when the person's core temperature falls during the rewarming process. This is thought to be due to peripheral vasodilation. Warmed IV fluids can be given and the fluids should be between 38 and 42 degrees C. If required, internal rewarming can be considered, including warmed humidified oxygen, peritoneal and pleural cavity lavage with warm fluids and ECMO. While a 3 to 5 degree drop in body temperature is thought to be cardioprotective, cardiac irritability will occur from about 33 degrees and VF is more likely once core body temperature reaches 28 degrees. Arrest drugs and defibrillation are not effective at temperatures this low. If VF is present, then shock it to a maximum of three times. If it persists, then delay any further shocks until the body temperature is at least 28 degrees. Arrest drugs such as adrenaline and amiodarone should be delayed until the body temperature is 30 degrees. Below this threshold, pooling of the drugs in the vasculature would risk toxic release on rewarming. Once the body temperature reaches 30 degrees, then drugs can be given, but at twice the intervals as a normothermic patient, until their temperature reaches 35 degrees. It's important to know that the solubility of oxygen and carbon dioxide is increased at lower temperatures. As a result, there is controversy about how ABGs should be interpreted. A warmed ABG sample from a hypothermic patient will show a higher PO2, a higher PaCO2, and a lower pH than is actually present in the patient's blood. The best approach is to use uncorrected values. To summarise the main points of this mini-gem, elderly patients are particularly vulnerable due to the normal physiology of ageing and the high likelihood of risk factors. Prevention of hypothermia is better than cure, so be able to signpost the elderly patient how they can keep warm in the winter, including where they can get financial assistance. Mild hypothermia needs passive rewarming and all other stages need active rewarming. Vital signs can be minimal or absent in profound hypothermia and patients can make a full recovery even after prolonged cardiac arrest. Hypothermia and cardiac arrest requires extra considerations. If you would like to know more on this subject, then there is a detailed module available on BMJ Learning called Accidental Hypothermia. The European Resuscitation Council Guidelines 2015 Section 4 Cardiac Arrest Under Special Circumstances details hypothermia in cardiac arrest. And the Age UK website has a section dedicated to keeping well this winter. Thank you.